You're listening to the Fantasy Sports Radio Network. It's Scout Fantasy Sports. I'll do it. How about that? All right, it's Dr. Roto. Get out the insurance cards. Get out the copay. The office is open, my friends. Adam Ronis, the man with the greatest draft luck in the history of fantasy drafting. Good morning. Good afternoon. I, well, What's look, up? I went on this morning with Corey Parson and Jay Sealy <laughs> talking about this. And you know that. I was I the hate, one who started this whole but thing. I, you know but that. I, but I think it's, it's, it's a little disrespectful. No, to me. no, yeah, no, it is. no, no. Because no, you're see, basically saying no, I look no, into no, things. No, 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 no. I gave you more credit than everybody because I say you are smart enough, Adam Ronas, that when the pick is there, you make it every time. That's why you're Adam Ronas. Well, see, it's one thing to be lucky, but you got to be lucky and good, which you are. Well, yeah, and a lot of people may passed up these selections as well. There's 14 other people in the room. And part of being successful in life is capitalizing on people's mistakes. So, you know, one of the reasons why Bill Belichick is a great coach is because the rest of the coaches in the league, there's a lot of ineptitude there. And he just doesn't outsmart himself. He just takes advantage of it. Now, this year, we saw a coach in Doug Peterson who wasn't sitting back. He was aggressive. And he went at the Patriots, and he won. But we don't see a lot of coaches like that. So that's part of life is you have to capitalize on people's mistakes. And, yeah, there were a couple players that slipped that I did not expect to get. But there were 14 other owners in the room who had the opportunity to make that selection, and they did it. Oh, no, no. Look, once again, I will say, just because the player's there, so you got to be smart enough to take the player when the opportunity arises. That's your job. So you're absolutely right. People have different valuations. I just think it's just crazy that you know the guy literally falls in your lap. I mean, did you ever – did you wake up yesterday thinking you're getting Madison Bumgarner in the third round? No, I didn't. I so basically, this is we're talking about the fifteen team tout wars mixed league draft from last night, where it's on base percentage instead of average, and the way they do the draft order is in order of finish. So obviously, Rudy Gamble won last year. I had won the previous two years, and he finished second to me. He's a really good player. We go back and forth, and he'll join us on the show later in the week. Then we'll talk to him. So he obviously took one. The next team took two. The next team took 12, and the next team took 15. Yeah, so then how, how I was up. 12? That was just dumb. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Just, I would take 12. Seriously? Where would you have taken? Oh, I would have taken Nolan Arenado. Thank you no, very I'm much. Saying, are you at three? Well, yeah, see. there you go. Because I know I'm getting out two-bay trout or Arenado. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I think in a, if it was a 5x5 five five Roto League, I would have taken three. But he takes not a hit, but his OBP is not elite it's good it's good. i mean it's still good enough to draft him in the in the first five six picks yes but for me the way I, so i chose 10 because i didn't see a huge difference between three and nine so no, i but, felt but right I but gene, that gene got you a couple times though because gene took vado and i know you thought you were going to get him that was part of the plan was because i look vado went 12 last year right. so but when I saw Gene took eight, I'm like, okay, I might, yeah. he's a very sharp player. <laughs> See, the right. thing with Votto is, and a lot of people are probably sitting there like, why is Votto a first-round pick? I don't get it. OBP? He gives you such a huge advantage in OBP. He is going to be 80 points higher than some of these other guys, and he doesn't crush you in other categories. He's a guy that stayed relatively healthy, and he gives you 30, 100. He scores runs. He just allows you to do so much Can we say it's like a guy who hits 340? Can we say his OBP is like a guy who hits 340? I think you might even say higher. I mean, guy, I mean that's, that's how good he is. He He's like a, Tony Gwynn. He had a 454 OBP yeah. last year. Arenado's yeah, like 370. It's, it's just enormous. The, and it allows you to take, you know, Odor and guys like that later that you wouldn't think about. Look, I wasn't disappointed. I knew I was going to get a good player. So that's why I said, let me go 10 so, because well, I'll get a good player to start. I'll come back with another good player, offensive player, likely in round two, unless one of the elite four dropped which pitchers, and I knew they won it. And then I figured I'd get a pitcher in round three. I never thought it would be Bumgarner. Right. No, no. You, was, it, you drafted in a great spot. So I, I guess I have a question. I, know, I think I know your answer because I know you like the power-speed combo. I, I'm, I only played this Tout Wars OBP. It's the first time I played it last year. And to be honest with you, I'm in the head-to-head league, and I sacrifice that category. So I can't tell you I'm an OBP expert. I'm not. I do love Paul Goldschmidt as a rule. 
I love the, the batting average. I love the power. I love the speed that you get at first base. Did you th- even consider him where you took Mookie Betts? Yes, it was between Betts, Goldschmidt, and Blackman, and it was a really tough decision, and I didn't expect it to be that tough. I figured... I thought Goldschmidt might be there because we've seen him drop because of the humor, but in an OBP league, he'll still be fine. You know, maybe he loses a few home runs. If what the physicists are saying are accurate and we see anywhere from a 25 to 50 percent drop in the home runs or the runs, you know, Gold's OK. So Goldschmidt hits 30 and, you know, right, still has 38. Good, right. Right. And it still has good counting stats. And even if his OBP drops a little bit, it'll still be a lead. So. He was in consideration. And, of course, Blackman, who's moving to number three in the order. The difference was is just bets to me the five-category guy. The stolen bases he's going to get. Okay. He, he That's what have, I thought you would have said. He doesn't have the power of the other guys. But even in a year last year where a lot of people consider it was a disappointment, he still had 100 runs. He still had 100 RBIs. And J.D. Martinez's addition to this lineup, just it's a huge boost. They were last in the American League last year in home runs. I really love this lineup. So it was a close call. I'm pretty heavily invested in Mookie Betts this year. This might be the third or fourth league I've taken him in. But it was it was a close call. Uh, I, it was a tough decision. And uh, I was happy. Yeah, I think you'd be happy with any three of those guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, I probably would have gone Goldschmidt one, Betts two, Blackman three. But I can't blame you. I know you like Mookie Betts. I like Mookie Betts. I took him at the FSTA gladly at pick number eight. So I mean, if you look at the differences between those two players, obviously besides position, first and outfield, Betts is going to get you more steals, right. and Goldschmidt's going to have the higher OBP. Outside of that, they're pretty similar. But, Maybe but, Goldschmidt but, has a little bit more power. I think what I like about Goldschmidt is that he gives you that first base stolen bases that nobody else does, right? He can get you 18 to 20, where no other first baseman's doing that except for, like, Will Myers. So I, there's a little advantage there. I, so I probably would have taken that advantage. But, th- I, look, I, I can't. Mookie Betts is a star. He's a star player, and I think he has a bigger, better year than last year. So round two comes. And I know you're high on J.D. Martinez. I know you're high on him. But just for purposes of this argument, if he was taken, who would your other guy have been? Manny Machado. It was a close decision there. Uh, Obviously, Machado, I think, is much better than he showed last year. He had some poor luck. Obviously, there's always the possibility he gets dealt. But it was a close call. Aaron Judge moves up a little bit in this format, too, because of the OBP. But I'm just concerned that the numbers drop from what we saw last year in terms of the power. But Judge was in consideration only because of the OBP. If it was average, I wouldn't consider him. But, you know, he had a 422 OBP last year. Even if the average drops, he draws so many walks. So uh, he's nice in this format, too. All right. I'm loving Mad B- Madison Bumgarner. Now, I know you would have taken... Would, I assume you would have taken Bumgarner over DeGrom if they were both there. Yeah, I would. I have Bumgarner ranked higher. I'm a huge DeGrom fan. I'm invested in him heavily. I think we talked about the NL labor auction the other day where he went for $24, which was, to me, way too cheap. I understand he's dealing with the back now, but he threw a couple of innings, and he's going to pitch, I believe. I think he threw a simulated game yesterday. I believe he's going to pitch Sunday. So even if he's not ready to go game one, game four, game five, he'll be good to go. It doesn't sound like there's anything serious. Uh, but I'm surprised that Bumgarner, I, I'm just oh, stunned. Yeah. Like, Zach Grinke went before him, Justin Verlander. I, look, there's, there's there's no way, Brian, Do- there's no way Bumgarner should have been there at your spot. There's no way. It doesn't there's happen. No I haven't seen any. I think there's there are people who are concerned about Bumgarner because when he came back last year, he wasn't as good as he used to be. His fastball wasn't as good. He's never been a guy that throws for high velocity. He's 91-92. He knows how to pitch. And it was his shoulder that he hurt in the dirt bike accident. But now he has a full off season. He pitched in the spring the other day, and spring doesn't mean much. But when you go out there and throw three perfect innings, I think that's a good sign. He, he didn't walk many guys last year. He got hurt by the home run, but pretty much every pitcher did last year. It's a good home ballpark. He has the full off season to rest. He's healthy now. Every right. pitcher has risk. He's healthy right, right now. Every pitcher has risk. I agree with that. But for purposes of this discussion, let's assume DeGrom and Bumgarner both would not there. Who would you have taken? Severino. So you were going to take a, you're taking a pitcher there. And I had said this I, on the podcast today that I did for ScoutFantasySports.com. There were only like two or three teams that didn't take a pitcher in the first three rounds. I, I would have said that you had to have come home with a pitcher there. Yeah, I mean, look, can you make it work? Sure. But I think in pretty much almost every draft this year I've done, I usually come away with at least one pitcher in the first three rounds. And then some drafts I followed up quickly, other drafts I've waited. It really depends on the flow of the draft, and you have to read the room. That's what I did here. I had a sense that at one point 
people were waiting on pitching, and that's why I went a little offense heavy. But I wanted to get a pitcher there, and uh, you know, Severino, if he would have been there. The one thing though that I, it's amazing to me. People talk about Syndergaard and how hard he throws, and they're worried about injury because obviously he did get hurt last year. But people were like, "Oh, he's throwing 100, 101 in his first game out. He's not easing into it." But no one says anything about Severino throwing 97, 98 as a young pitcher, and no one's concerned for injury for him. It's amazing, like. Adam, I, I am so past all this. I think we have to be concerned for injury for every pitcher. Every, every pitcher, on. especially. Every pitcher. Because you know what? At any moment, in any start, a dude could go and feel a little bit tug of the elbow, and that's it. I mean, how many times did we see that last year? No, it, for sure. I, you, look at, you can look at all, all the pitchers, even the top four, and there's risk there with them. Kershaw sure. on his back. Kluber was injured last year. He missed some time. Sale has tailed off. Has always, has, but he's always missed in, in the past. He's right. always had a deal. His, his last two months of the season, the last two years, haven't been great. Scherzer's getting older and has a lot of innings on his arm. So all these guys have concern. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so let's say round four comes, and I know you like Justin Upton. I mean, I know you're an Upton fan. Why abray you over Upton, who... Hard to pass on Upton. But I know you had two, two outfielders. Was it that you wanted a little diversity there? Well, you know, it was funny because I almost went Ben Attendee in round three. I said, you know what? Let's do DFS yeah. now. That's Jamie yeah. Ben Attendee. No, I couldn't do that. Like a Red Sox fan. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, I'm a Red Sox fan now all of a sudden. No, Abreu, to me, I, I thought he fell a little bit too far, too. There's something about consistency. And I think a lot of times people don't like the boring player. And I think that's what Abreu is. He's a boring player. All he does is every year is go out there and produce. 300, well, 290, 300, 30 homers, 100 RBIs. And it's at least 30 home runs in three of his four seasons, 100 RBIs every year, 359 career OBP, very solid production. No, across his solid are rocks. And, and you know what? That offense is pretty good. Moncada, I mean, uh, there's some guys there that are starting to hit that uh, I, I think Chicago, I don't like their pitching staff, but I think their offense is better. Definitely. And he just produces every year. So, yeah, yeah I'm an Upton fan, no question about it. But uh, I already had uh, part of it. Uh, part of it was first base. I think first base kind of thins out a little bit. I notice it gets kind of ugly if you don't take first base early. Not that I have to. I don't care about position. No, but, but it does drop off to me after Will Myers. It's a it's it's a steep it's a steep cliff. Right. You have guys that will hit for power, but they're going to be deficient somewhere. They might hit for a low average. So I just like the consistency of Brayu. He stayed healthy. So that's why I took him over Upton. All right, round five comes, and you take Lorenzo Cain, who's in a really great spot this year. I mean, this is a guy who could have 20 home runs and 30 stolen bases. All he has to do is just stay healthy in that lineup, and I, and I think he's like guaranteed to have success. Yeah, it, I didn't really love anyone in this round. It's not like I looked at the board and said, oh, yes, I'm getting Lorenzo Cain. This is great. There just wasn't anything there that really stood out to me. So do I like King? Yes. And I've taken him other drafts. It might seem early for some, but I think he's rising a little bit. Who else he's, did you think of there? Who, give, me, give me another option that you would have taken there. Uh, to be honest, really, I didn't really like anyone else uh, at this point. I didn't want to go closer. Uh, did you think Otani? No. I, I wouldn't go. I would not have gone closer. I'm looking at the number, the board. I'll tell I would you have this. Gone Cano. I would I would have went Kenley Jensen if he slipped. Now it didn't matter because, but he went late in this. He went. He did uh, go late. Five, he went round, round five. five, pick four. So right. I was like, wait a second. I don't want to take close early, but if Kenley, uh, one of the most reliable closers, is no, there, you take him. You I'm take absolutely him. taking him. But uh, he didn't make it. So Chris Davis was in consideration. He went before. So there wasn't really no one that stood out, but. Kane. Bo, yeah, Bogarts I wouldn't have taken. Domingo Santana I wouldn't have taken. Yeah, it, it was a spot where I'm like, I don't love anyone here. But Kane is a guy that contributes in every category. And the Paul, he, look, he's not a big power hitter, but the ballpark's got to help him. Last year, oh, yeah. he had 15 home runs. He had three at home in Kansas City. Yeah, no, so, he can go 20 this year. I think 20 is legit. And he's going to steal bases. The Brewers yeah. are aggressive. He has at least 26 steals in three of his last four years. The one year he didn't get there, he was hurt. He played in 103 games. And... So, oh, great lineup. The counting stats are going to be there. Runs RBI, right. so, so he helps across the board. So, let's talk now in round six. I know you like Masahiro Tanaka, right? I know he's one of your guys. Not really. Um, I haven't taken him in any draft yet. But you, I know you like, like him in general. Well, he's he's been a good friend to me in the past. Hello? He's come on the shows. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Um, did you think of anybody? I mean, I like John Zagura. Did you think of anybody else besides? If Roberto Osuna had made it to your spot, or Ozzy Albies had made it to you, would you have taken them? 
Probably not. I like Albies a lot. He, he's going earlier. I like Asuna, but I didn't want to take him there. Again, this was another spot where I looked at the board and there was nothing that I was enamored with at all. I thought about going pitching like Dallas Keuchel or Pax, and I'm like, ah, they might make it back, and they almost did. They didn't, but I felt like, okay, you know what? I'll probably take a pitcher next round. I'm not going to panic here. And, you know, so maybe I wasn't giving Segura enough credit when I look back on things. Uh, he's got some pop. He's going to hit second in the lineup this year with D. Gordon hitting lean off. Cano, Cruz, and Seager behind him. Yeah, he's him. in a great spot. He is in a great spot, Segura. And, and Might another be the best guy, spot in baseball. Another guy who's had at least 20 steals in all five of the seasons he's played. He had some injuries last year. Uh, I know this is not a batting average league, but 300 and 319 the last two years. And the OPP you know, should be respectable, 350, 360, even though he doesn't walk a lot. So it is going to be reliant on the average. But he's a good hitter, so I think the RBI should go up from what it was last year. Runs will be solid, runs and he's going to steal bases. So, again, another guy that kind of contributes across the board. And he had 20 home runs in 2016. I know it was playing in Arizona, but there's potential for 15 to 18 here. So round seven comes. Would you have taken, just very quickly before we get to break, would you have taken James Paxton if he was there, or would you have taken Cole? I probably would have taken the shot with Paxton. I, there's definitely question marks of how many innings he can give you but there's no doubt when he is on the mound the upside that he presents yeah no i i i like cole i would have taken paxton but it didn't matter gene stole him i like gene's draft a ton gene did a very good job here but i like where we're going here ronas and i like some of your picks coming up i'm looking forward to our next segment where adam ronas continues to break down his tout wars mixed league draft and what i love about what ronas did here the guys he mentions all the time on the website on Scout Fantasy Sports, these are guys that he drafted. That's what I love to see. All right, it was an outstanding job. We will continue to go through Adam's draft. A lot of pitchers that he liked. Who are they? We'll let you know when we return right after this. Watch Craig Carton live, the top eight at nine on twitch.tv from the Fantasy Sports So 120 Network, tomorrow for Gene, you want it, right? Every Monday yeah. through Thursday at nine o'clock Eastern. Do you want to be a part of the show? Take part in the Twitch chat room and give me your opinions or call in 844-84-FNTSY. Go to twitch.tv slash Craig Carton live and get in on the action. Come get some. It's Craig Carton live, the top eight at nine, only on twitch.tv. It's Dr. Roto. Get out the insurance cards. Get out the copay. The office is open, my friends. I'm a senior fantasy expert at Scout Fantasy Sports, and I'm back on the airwaves here at the Fantasy Sports Network. 78% of our subscribers took home a fantasy title in 2017. And with my partner, Adam Ronas, there's no better team of baseball experts in the industry than the team here at Scout Fantasy Sports. There's 11 losers in every league. Don't be a sheep and follow the herd. Sign up today at ScoutFantasySports.com. Have you ever wanted to have a fantasy expert in the palm of your hand? Or better yet, in the pocket of your khakis? Well, check it out. Now you can. It's the Fantasy Sports Radio Network app. Download it now to your phone. We promise no weird viruses, no strange tracking things. Just 24 hours a day, seven days a week of pure fantasy knowledge dropping all over your head. It's the Fantasy Sports Radio Network app. Stop being a weirdo and streaming it online. Get it on your phone. Take it with you everywhere you go. Muscle Maker Grill was made for baseball season. Muscle Maker Grill supplies you with delicious, healthy meals that will give you energy to cheer on your team week after week. Whether you're craving flavorful salad, packed wraps, or guiltless entrees, Muscle Maker Grill has you covered. Hosting a game? No problem. Our catering packages will have your whole team satisfied with flavors ranging from Italian to Tex-Mex and much, much more. Visit MuscleMakerGrill.com for your nearest location and have a winning season. The sun can make your outdoor deck and patio space so hot and uncomfortable, you can't use it. But now there's the Sunsetter Retractable Awning. A Sunsetter Retractable Awning opens and closes in just 60 seconds, and it keeps your patio about 20 degrees cooler. It provides instant shade and protection from the sun's harmful rays. You can get your Sunsetter for as little as $5.99 when you call now to get your special $200 discount certificate and free awning idea kit. You're going to love your Sunsetter Retractable Awning. 
Sunset or awnings are assembled in America and guaranteed to last for years. So call 800 869 5446 now to get a free awning idea kit with DVD plus your $200 Sunsetter discount certificate. This is a limited time offer, so call 800 869 5446 now. That's 800 869 5446 for your free awning idea kit with DVD and $200 discount certificate. There's no obligation, so call 800 869 5446 now. All right, we're back for Scout Fantasy Sports. Dr. Roto here, along with Adam Ronas. And Adam Ronas, I don't know if you know this, but every three minutes, an American is diagnosed with blood cancer. And unfortunately, only 30% of patients are able to find a compatible bone marrow donor within their family. But that's how you can help. Go to dkms.org slash FNTSY today and sign up online to register as a donor. DKMS will send you a swab kit, which takes legitimately one minute to do. You swab each of your cheeks and send it back to them, and that's it. You're done. DKMS will then try and match you up with a person in need of a donation. The process is easy. The best of all, you could actually save someone's life. Not metaphorically, but literally. Check out dkms.org slash FNTSY to see how you can help. All right, we are talking about Adam Ronis's draft here and last night, the Tout Wars Mixed League. And, you know, Ronis, I do, I, I say what, you know, on Scout Fantasy Sports, you, you're, you're, the draft kit is amazing. And your articles are in there. And I love the fact that you basically drafted the guys that you preach in the articles. Yeah, I always do. There's transparency here. If I say something, and I always try to do that. If I'm going to tell you something on the air or write an article, I'm going to actually do it in my draft. I've always been like that. I'm not trying to hold secrets back. And I am playing with people in leagues who are listening. And they're going to know who I like. There's nothing I can do with it. My job here is to help people win. I want to win myself, but that's not primarily what I'm here for. I think it helps and it gives us credibility when we win because there's so many people out there right now and you want to differentiate it. And I think when you're listening to people where you know they have success and do well, I think it just enhances things. But, yeah, these are a lot of guys that I've written up, I've talked about, and there's a reason why they're on my team. All right, so round eight, we'll go quickly. Nicholas Castellano, so really love this guy. I mean, he plays two positions. Yoan Moncada, I can, I'll just mention, love Yoan Moncada this year, Ronis. If there's one dude who could bust out, he could be the guy. Yeah, and I actually have him in quite a few leagues already. And last year, he was the guy that everyone talked about in the preseason. And people were drafting him late and stashing him. And unfortunately, he didn't come up to July. So there might have been some people that couldn't hold on and dropped him. And that's always the risk you present with prospects. I think if we said before the year last year, who's going to be up first, uh, Bellinger or Moncada? I said a lot of Moncada people, for sure. Right. And Bellinger came up in April early and didn't stop hitting. They weren't going to send him down. Even when he first came up, people were like, well, how much fab should I spend? I know I probably didn't go as high in one league because I was worried he might be sent down if he struggled. And he did it, and he went off and had a huge year. We saw Moncada come up in July. Wasn't good the first month. Got better in August and was really good in September. And that's what I love to see because a lot of these guys, they don't struggle. They dominate everywhere they go. And the first taste of struggle, how do they rebound? I've right. talked about this before. Alex Look Bregman, at Alex was, Bregman. Yeah, when he Bregman. first came up, he was one for 32. That can right. send a guy soaking, and, and you could be done. He didn't. He rebounded, made adjustments, finished strong. Moncada, the same thing. Really good September. He's been hitting the leadoff here in the spring. He had a stolen base the other day, which I think is very important. We know he can run, but he's got to show he can have success at the big league level. Only three of five last year. Again, small sample, but the fact that they might hit him leadoff, and he's going to run. He's got some pop, and he gets a boost in an on-base percentage league because he draws walks. You know, I'll even equate that to being in a fantasy league. Maybe you're new to fantasy. Maybe you're sitting out there listening, and you're like, ah, I just started this. Maybe you lost your first year. Maybe you lost your first two or three years. It doesn't mean you quit. It means you keep on trying and get better, right? Just because Alex Bregman went one for 32 didn't mean the Astros gave up on him, right? Good things happen if you put the effort in. And I believe that whether in anything in life, Adam, I think the more, you know, you can't quit on yourself and the best players figure out how to rebound from setbacks. Absolutely. And you're learning at the big league level. It's a lot different than the minor leagues and you have to make some adjustments. You can't just come up here and get by on talent. It doesn't work like that. And the fact that Moncada got better as each month went along to me was a good sign. And let's not forget, this guy was 
regarded as like the best prospect last year. And it's funny how it wears off quickly. It seems like people don't really talk about Moncada now. And it's like on to the next thing. Ronald Acuna, you know, like. Right. The, right, right. Well, that's, that's the post type sleeper. Look at Severino last year. Who even drafted that guy in most leagues? People just left him for dead. The fan attitude was the guy ta- was preaching Severino all off season last year. Severino, Severino, Severino. And he was absolutely right. Yeah, I took him in tout last year. That was one of my better picks, fortunately. I, you know, that's why I was staying afloat was my pitching. I drafted Kluber early and Severino, even though Gossman and Salazar crushed me. But, yeah, you know, they're, 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 guys figure it out. Severino has a good arm, and he had a bad season the year before. But you make some adjustments, add a changeup, and get some experience. And, and it really – I don't think anyone could have seen the season, though, that Severino had last year. I mean, that right. was just – that was insane. So let's go to uh, the, out of your next six picks, five or pitchers. The first guy you took was Jeff Samarja. I know we discussed him on the program at a, a lengthy uh, amount yesterday. I know you like him. Uh, so he makes your third starter, Bumgarner, Cole, Samarja, really good front three. Then you take a guy who I think is going to get a lot of late looks. Blake Trinan might be the cheapest, best late closer you can draft. Yeah, I have a lot of shares already, so I'm hoping he doesn't let me down because there's always volatility with closers. But I decided, look, I'm not going to take one of the elite, so I'm going to wait. And then I was just trying to figure out, okay, when am I going to take a closer? I wanted to get at least one good one, and then I'll speculate on relievers late unless there was a value that fell. It's a 15-team league, so people are going to take the closers a little bit earlier. They're worried, but that's a position where we see constant turnover, and I'll have to work it out on the waiver wire. And I didn't do a good job of it last year. It was one of the things that hurt me is I was always searching for, for saves. I drafted Kelvin Herrera as my first guy. I was very high on him, and I was wrong. He was not he was good. Terrible. Yeah, yeah he was, I, I, I don't know what happened with him. The guy was dominant as a setup man, and he just struggled last year. So I had we talk about him for, Let's talk about him for a second. You know, this year he's on a bad t- a wretched team. He's got a, con- a one-year deal. I mean, I assume he gets traded at some point. If he gets traded, he may not even be a closer this year. Yeah, I don't worry about closers on bad teams because even the crappiest teams are going to win 60 games. And no, but I worry about if he gets traded, right. he's not going to be a closer. Yeah, that, that, that would be the issue is uh, more than likely he would go to a team where they already have a closer and they're looking to fortify their bullpen for a postseason run. So, yeah, I haven't drafted him. Uh, it, it was just a terrible year. I mean, the home runs jumped, the walks went up, the strikeouts went down. It just was a bad year for him last year. So I have not uh, drafted him in any leagues yet. If you're in an auction league, 15-team auction, how much are you paying for Kelvin Herrera? I'm not paying for him. Zero. Yeah, I mean, someone's going to spend more than me. So uh, What do you think he goes for? Him. If you, you don't go for him, what do you think he goes for? Around 10. Okay, that's about right. But uh, right. training tra- last year, though, when he went to the A's... 38 innings, 42 strikeouts, 12 walks, 2-1-3 ERA, and a 1-1-5 whip. I mean, he oh, was no, yeah, really no. good. Yeah, I mean, he was Blake train wreck in the beginning, and then it yes. got a lot better. So, I mean, uh, that, we always knew he had the ability. He just c- couldn't locate the plate. All right, so then we, in round 14, we've talked about Taiwan Walker. I know you're very high on him. We've got the whole humidor thing. The guy we all thought was 30 years old. He's really only 24. I'm a big fan of Jamison Tyon, man. I think this could be the year of something for, special for him. Yeah, I like him a lot, too. You know, he's coming back from testicular cancer surgery. The fact that he even stepped foot on the mound after that, to me, is just brave in itself. He had a good first half and wasn't good when he came back. But I just give him a a lot of courage for going out there and and getting through it. And I think he's better than what he has shown. He's 26 now. I think he's ready to take a step up to the next level. Uh, He doesn't allow a lot of fly balls. He doesn't allow a lot of hard hits. He throws 95-96. And I think this is the year that you see him take that step up. All right. Your next guy, Ronas, we got to talk about a little bit. All right. Because this guy's nickname is Gas Can. Because we've been talking about Kevin Gossman being good now for three years. And he hasn't been very good at all. I look at Kevin Gossman as a DFS play on a random night when he could actually win you a lot of money because he has those nights where he goes eight innings and four hits and seven strikeouts and he's a gem. And then the next time he's out, it's like one, one and two thirds, seven runs and he kills you. Why take the chance there when you could have gone? I don't know. Andrew Miller, Sean Manaya, who I know you like, Jake Faria. I'm just throwing out names that were there. Why gas can? I thought I do like Manaya, but I thought I could get him later. But Gossman made some changes in the second half last year, 
89 and two thirds innings, a 3 4 1 ERA, a 1 2 0 whip, 9.6K per nine, 2.81 walks per nine. The home runs were still a problem, and that's probably the biggest issue for him. And it's unfortunate, you know, being in Cam the Yards, it might always be an issue. But from June 21st forward last year, he had a 3 3 9 ERA. He averages 95 miles per hour with his fastball. He has a good splitter. And he brought back a slider in the middle of the season. It really helped turn his season around. And he also made a mechanical tweak where he squared himself more towards home plate. So if you want more details, I wrote this up, scoutfantasysports.com. It's part of the draft kit and a ton of articles on there, including one on Gossman. So definitely check it out. So in 12 of his last 19 starts, he allowed two earned runs or less. And it's no, no. I mean, look, he can be great. I mean, that's the interesting thing. When he's great, he's great. But he could also let have three. What if I told you that, let's say he has 30 starts, 20 of them are gems, but 10 are so wretched, he's letting up five runs or more on those, and it, hits, it makes his GERA 3.82. Right. Yeah, and it happened to me last year. I actually drafted him in tout. I wound up drop, dropping him. So I missed a lot of the second half. But he's my sixth starting pitcher. And what I'm looking for in, this, in round 15 is someone that has the potential – to take a step forward, and we did see it over the second half. Now he might start the season and be garbage again. But what other – these pitchers in these rounds, they, they all have some risks. I've seen Gossman have success at the big league level, and he had a good second half two years ago. He has the stuff. Let's see now if he can put it together for an entire year. Okay. Now – the next two picks you had were two very good outfielders. One I like more. I think I like the second guy more than the first guy. Willie Calhoun was just born to hit. Tell me about Bradley Zimmer, though. You know, I think the speed is there. I worry the power's not there yet. What do you like about him? Yeah, I think there's, you know, he's going to play every day. It's a good lineup. I think there, there is some power that can emerge here. You know, I think he can get, he had eight and 101 games last year. So I'm looking for 15 to 18. I think the steals could go up uh, and, you know, obviously strikes out quite a bit and the OBP is going to be a little bit low. But I think this is a player that we might not have seen the best to come from him yet. And it's cheap. I mean, he could be a 15 homer, 20, 25 steal guy. Maybe not great OBP, but if you get 15 homers and 25 steals this late in the draft, you got to be ecstatic. Right. No, no. And, and you could have that. I mean, could he, 15 home runs, 20 st- 25 stolen bases. I, I would think he, he should be able to get that. Right. Is that but the power may not be there. I, I worry more about the 15 home runs, but I think the 25 steals is there. Yeah, I think the speed will be there for sure. It's a question of uh, can he develop some more power this year? All right. Let's just take a look at your and do your draft like from round 18 through 29 as a whole. Uh, Hedges and Guriel and Drury and Keela, Candelario, Alfaro, Fisher, uh, Dominic Leone. I thought you had a couple of very nice picks there. I thought Guriel would have gone five rounds earlier had he been healthy. I think Drury's in a great spot. Keela might actually be the closer for the Rangers. Yeah, I have no idea what they're doing. I mean, it looks like Alex Claudio is the guy right now, but he's not a guy that throws hard. He is a ground ball, extreme ground ball pitcher. Tim Lincecum, actually, it looks like he's in good shape. I mean, I don't know if he closes, but, hey, it's wide open here. Kayla has a good arm. He's had some off-the-field issues, but seeming like he did some maturing here in the offseason. He's got some shoulder issues to deal with, but, again, I'm trying to take a fly here and a couple guys late. Uh, him and Leon uh, potentially could close. That's an, that's the weakness of my draft, obviously, is saves. I really only have one closer. and As good as training was last year, I mean, what if he starts the season poorly? So right. uh, there's on a, on always a bad, on a bad team, on a right. team that's there, not bad, but mediocre. There's always risk with all these guys. So, but that's an area I think you can fix and plug in. And with Gurriel, there's unlimited DL spots in this league. So as soon as waivers opens up, I'll put Gurriel on the DL and I, pick someone else up. Can we talk about that for a second? And you, I, I think if I remember correctly, you don't agree with me. You have, let's say, five guys go on the DL. Right? And you put them on the DL. And then you pick up five more guys. And then you make trades. Isn't it unfair to make trades with guys because your roster really has more, five more people than they should? No. I mean, if you're going to have DL spots, that's part of the deal. I know, but it it's almost seems like I don't like the unlimited DL thing. I think it's a problem. I think there should be like two spots or three spots. I mean, you shouldn't just be able to have all these guys in the DL. So it's, it can be an unfair advantage. 
How is it an unfair advantage, Doc? You're probably using play, you're losing players who are productive, and you're picking up less productive players off the waiver wire. How is there an advantage if I lose JD Martinez and because you Lorenzo stash, Cain? Because you can stash them. How am I stash? Sta- but I'm, but I'm but losing. I am losing elite production. No, I, I get that, and I'm not arguing that. I'm saying that it, it, there is. You have to see it from this side. There is an element of stashing. I'm sorry, and, when you're, and you're making trades with guys that you have. Have a roster. If I have nobody injured, right? Nobody injured. My roster is what twenty nine guys. Your roster is thirty four. Would you, you have rather have five from? guys on the DL or none? I will take none every day of the week. And okay, you can but, go pick but, up what, five scrubs now, off the waivers. Let's argue that it's your five worst players are on the DL. Your five crappy Stephen Matz DL, uh, Derek Fisher DL, Ronaldo Lopez DL. Guys, you don't even need right now. It's not, you don't think there's an unfair advantage here at all. No, it's not an advantage because I'm picking up players that are probably not as good. Now, yeah, maybe I'll pick up a Justin Smoke who hits. Right. But, so now all of a sudden you picked up Justin Smoke but, who but, hits? Uh, look, Doc, I always say this to you. If you don't like the le- rules of the league, don't play in it. No, we all know this true. going in. Right? Uh, no, no. And look, every league is different. My home league, I think we do three DL spots. I get it. You know, If you don't want unlimited spots, fine. But we're all playing by the same rules here. I'm not getting an advantage. I'd rather have no guys hurt, okay? You want to have seven guys on the deal, and you think you have an advantage because you're getting seven extra guys? Do it, Doc. I want my guys healthy. Here's what I'd like, and you you could disagree with me. I'd like to have... 10 reserves, including everything. DL, reserve, whatever it is. It's one run list. That way we have the same number of players. Well, yeah, and that's what the high stakes leagues do. 23 yeah. spots, 7 that's guys it. on the bench. That's it. That's it. And that, to me, is more fair than the stash way. That, I, I could that, Look, if the high stakes leagues, they all do so, it that uh, way, right? So they then, all do okay, it. Okay, so when you're in a high stakes league, right, and there's 30 yeah. roster spots, and you have 9 guys in the DL, are you going to cry and bitch that, oh, no, oh, 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 that's, okay. I have to dump you're, you're not going to make excuses to the not, a, not one excuse. Okay, now, I'll, I'll, I will I'll be upset. I'll be upset that I lost that year because of injury, but it won't. But I, it's not, there's nothing unfair about it because we all have the same number of roster spots. Okay, and because you know, because a lot of people make excuses. Oh, I had no, a lot no, of injuries. Look, I had Starlin Marte last year. The guy, you know, was out for for uh, three quarters of the year. What can I do? That's it. Yeah, it was a su- right. suspension, and yeah. sometimes there again. That's where the luck element of luck comes into play. Sometimes you get a little unlucky. That's true. All right, you want to get lucky in PGA DFS? You better listen up. Coming up next, you want to win at Valspar? Jeff Bergerson, Fantasy Golf Insider is going to be here. He's going to help us be your our, I know, rich friend. Maybe it's you. Come listen up when Jeff's here, when we're back right after this. Skix sneakers are taking over tailgates and alumni homes across America. Skix canvas high top, low top, slip on, and kids tennis style sneakers designed in officially licensed college colors and logos is a must have for every college fan's wardrobe. Fun, fashionable, and comfortable. Whether you're at the big game or watching the game at home, Skix helps fans perform better. Go to Skix.com and use promo code FNTSY for 15% off your pair now. That's Skix.com. Skix sneakers is the soul of a true fan. Steiner Sports is the leading memorabilia provider for the New York Yankees, Rangers, Giants, Knicks, and the Brooklyn Nets. Featuring hundreds of items from your favorite athletes, Steiner Sports is your source for the best sports gifts. Go to SteinerSports.com slash box and shop our collection of memorabilia boxes, which include 10 gifts for the price of one. We've made one for each of your favorite teams. Hurry, supplies are limited, and these are some of the best deals we have ever offered. So go to SteinerSports.com slash box today. Fantasy Sports Today. Um, Adam Rodas is doing it again. Look at him dominating the draft, the whole Twitterverse. Son, what is up? Your fantasy baseball people that follow you, son, put it back in your pants. Real recognize real. <laughs> oh, stop it. Real nah. recognize real. But you know what, though? The projections hate me, which I like. And I see people who have, like, no success putting these projections out. Because it helps them. And that wasn't a shot of you. I yeah, will yeah. let you know directly when I take a shot of you. I, I don't need to sugarcoat it. <laughs> There's a- Weekdays, 9 a.m. Eastern, only on the Fantasy Sports Radio Network. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then call Page Publishing at 800-955-3793 immediately. That's 800-955-3793. Page Publishing is looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review each and every book submitted to them and give you their feedback. If they like what they read, they'll get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, Barnes & Noble, and other outlets. They handle everything. Editing, cover design, copyright protection, printing, publicity, and 
and distribution. So if you've written a novel, children's book, cookbook, inspirational work, poetry, or a biography and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-955-3793 now for your free author submission kit. Again, for your free author submission kit, call 800-955-3793. That's 800-955-3793. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. Call Page Publishing at 800-955-3793 for your free author submission kit. Hey, I'm Jeff. Look, I'm just a skeleton. I don't have an ACL anymore, but I still like to know what it means when one of my fantasy players sprains his. That's why I use the Inside Injuries app. It was created by real doctors. So you're getting information directly from people who have seen, touched, and operated on actual ACLs. Take it from me, a skeleton. If you aren't using it, you might as well just be guessing. Download the free app today and unlock the secrets of injury analysis. All right, we're back. We're Scal Fantasy Sports. Talking PGA DFS. Nobody better to do that with than my friend Jeff Bergerson from FantasyGolfInsider.com. What's up, my friend? Long time no speak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm excited to uh, be chatting with you again. Uh, we got a great tournament to kick us off, Doc. I know. Uh, the Valspar is one of my favorite. I, and when they call a hole like the snake pit, that, uh, that's, that's my kind of tournament. Yes, the snake pit. It's a nasty few holes that uh, kind of close it out, 16, 17, and 18, and will change the the way the tournament uh, goes, that's for sure. Now, if I'm not mistaken, didn't Adam Hadwin rip this course up last year and have a huge day? Was that this course? Yes, he did. Uh, he was playing really well. He played, but a lot depends on the winds and the weather, because if, if the winds are harsh and it's looking like they could pick up on Friday a bit, this course becomes much more difficult. And it's usually pretty tricky. Um, but uh, if, it, if the weather's okay, then, then guys can score. Now, I know we, I don't know if we've mentioned this recently. Do you look at that whole AM, PM wave? So if you play Thursday morning, you play Friday afternoon, and if you play Thursday night, you play Friday morning. I mean, do you set your lineups accordingly? I do, uh, especially when well, I look closely at the weather and I send out an email to all of our members on Wednesday night detailing what the forecast is going to look like. Sometimes there isn't a big edge for a particular e-time wave, but sometimes there is. And if we can you know, stack guys in a certain wave of tee times and they get maybe a stroke advantage over the other wave of tee times, that's pretty huge. And this week it, it's kind of looking like we might have that. Um, now, of course, I'm not just picking random guys for a tee time wave. I'm still going with the guys in my core, just grouping them together with the times that they play. So in this tournament, do we want the Thursday a.m. Friday p.m. or do we want the Thursday p.m. Friday a.m.? As of right now, it's looking Thursday a.m., Thursday p.m., because the winds look light on Thursday a.m., and it looks like they're a little bit lighter on Friday in the afternoon. So those guys are going to have a bit of an edge as of what the forecast says right now. Okay. So when you look at guys, do you think, I mean, because Florida can be testy. It's a little chilly here today. It's going to be very cold here tomorrow. I mean, for us, cold is like 70, Jeff. You know what I'm saying? Right. I feel bad for you. I know. It's like Minnesota cold. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) you know, here, do you look for guys? Well, this guy plays well in win. Do you have your guys that are win guys? And if so, who are some of those guys this week? Um, Wind, not as much. I guess guys with lower ball flight you could go with play well in wind. But um, a big thing that I'm looking at on Florida course is guys who putt well on Bermuda. And um, there's a tons of guys from from the Florida area on the PGA Tour, so it's kind of hard to narrow down, you know, who's comfortable on those courses. But guys with low ball flights, guys like, um, say, Henrik Stenson are using a three-wood a lot. Uh, This particular course isn't necessarily short. But it favors um, more strategic um, where guys hit the ball, Um, not so much bombers. So there's several double dog legs. There's uh, tight fairways, a lot of trees. So more accuracy type players tend to come come out more than the bombers do um, here at Copperhead. Now you'd mentioned Bermuda grass. Was it Tony Finau? Is he the is he the bent grass guy? Is he the Bermuda grass guy? Which guys are the Bermuda grass guys? Yeah, the Bermuda grass guys are a lot of the guys who play better um, down in Florida. So 
Uh, Spieth is one of them who plays really well on Bermuda greens. Um, Hadwin does as well. Um, even like Webb Simpson plays well on Bermuda. Mostly the guys who um, played college golf down, you know, in, in the Carolinas or in Georgia or Florida uh, tend to putt well on Bermuda greens. Now, but Fino, if, if I'm not mistaken, is he a bent grass guy? He's a bent grass guy, yeah. Now, why are people talking him up like he's such a good play this week if he's not putting on the surface that he likes? Well, I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. It's just one factor that we look at. It's not going to discourage me. If, if a guy's got great form and has played well here in the past, just because he's maybe a stroke worse on Bermuda than Bent or Poa doesn't mean that I'm going to ignore him completely. But he's got a pretty good price this week, Finau in particular. He played well here last year after missing the cut uh, the two times before that. So I think he can compete. Normally, Finau, though, has a big edge over people because he hits it so far off the tee and, and gets an edge that way. Here, that's kind of negated um, by a lot of the, the way the course is set up. So he doesn't have as big of an edge as he normally does. All right, Jeff. So when I'm looking at my lineups, I can't see a way that I'm not putting Spieth on at least 40 to 50 percent of my teams. Agree or disagree? I agree with you this week. Um, I've heard mixed things in the industry, so I'm kind of torn on what his ownership's going to be like. Spieth has been ball striking outstanding. Tee to green, he's been phenomenal. It's been his putting. And I think the last time I, I talked to you, Doc, we talked about the same thing. I'm still confident that he's going to break out of this putting funk that he's in. And it could be this week because this is a great course for Spieth. He's a positional player. If he can just putt a little bit, I think he has a really good chance of winning this week. It's a little bit tougher with him this week with the pricing, though. And it's kind of like last week when Dustin Johnson was priced so high. The pricing's tight overall. So if we don't get a top five out of Spieth, we're really hurting because we have to neglect the rest of our roster to fit him in. Uh, there's no stacking of studs this week with the way the pricing is on DK. So we're going to need a big performance if we choose to roster Spieth this week. I, I did one lineup with Spieth and Stenson. Oh, man, I was really pull up, grasping for straws at the end there, dude. Yeah, and it's really tough to do that because the guys down in the 6K range, there's just almost no way you're going to get four guys down in that range that are going to finish in the top 20. It's right. almost impossible. So I, I would tend to not double stack studs and stay more in that upper 7K range rather than dropping down in the sixes. Because as you know, to win these large field GPPs, we got to have everyone in the top 20. So it doesn't oh. do us any good if we haven't guys, you know, finish first and second even if we got, you know, others missing the cut. So we're going to have to maybe not roster maybe one guy in the 6K range, but not several. I don't know if I told you this. I was one player away from coming in second at the Honda. I, had, I played Graham McDowell, but my other five guys all were top 10, Jeff. Is if that I just right? played somebody oh. else, I would have come in second. If I had a guy who just like hey, got me 50 points for the weekend, I would have had to come in second overall. That's how crazy oh. golf is. You have to have all six guys. You need them in the top 20. All these things have to go right. That's right. Oh, man, that's really good, Doc. That's, that's close. You're, you're almost there. Almost there is right. All right, let's talk about some other guys who might be close. Henrik Stenson, Justin Rose, Sergio Garcia, uh, Rory. If I don't want to go Spieth, are there any one of those top-end guys that you're willing to pay for? I think, um, I, I think Casey's going to be popular at 9,800. Uh, I kind of like Justin Rose is a little bit pivot off of him. He did not play well in Mexico for overall last week. Played well on Sunday, though. He had a nice Sunday charge. I like him a lot here. I like him at 10K, so if you want to go down from Spieth and save a little bit, I'd probably tend to go with Rose in that area. Otherwise, you can go with a more balanced approach, and there's a lot of guys in this 8K range that are, are very good. Um, Hadwin, I think, at 8,800 is, is a good option, although he could be rather chalky in a lot of the GPPs. So. Uh, I, I probably won't have much Hadwin if Isn't at all. Is he chalky and pricey? Because he's not usually an 8,800 golfer. No, he's usually in the sevens. Um, but he's been playing really well, and he clearly won last year. So it's a combination of those two things that jacked up his price to 8,800, which is going to prevent him from being like 30 or 40 percent on. But I still think he could be up in the in the 20 percent range. So I'm going to probably pivot off him to like a Brandon Grace. 
and I like using comparable courses. And I think Harbor Town, where the RBC Heritage is played, is a good uh, comparison course to Copperhead. And Brandon Grace, Brandon Grace kills it at Harbor Town. Doesn't have a long tournament history here; just a couple of appearances. And I don't think he's going to be very highly owned at 8600. So I kind of like him. Uh, others, you know, I mean, we've got Webb Simpson, 8,500. I think Ben Ann at 8,400 is a pretty decent option. He's been playing really well lately. So you can build a really solid uh, balanced team in this 8 and 9K range and not even d- dip below, you know, 7,800. Absolutely. We're talking to Jeff Bergerson from FantasyGolfInsider.com. I love the site. I absolutely recommend it. You guys should all check it out, but only if you want to win money, right, Jeff? If you don't want to win money, don't check it out. That's right. Then, then, then look somewhere else, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. If you want to be my rich friend, check out this site. All right. I'm going to throw out a name. Ryan Moore, another guy who's a little pricier than I would like to pay for him, but he tends to do well in this course. Am I paying up for him? Um, I'm okay with him. Yeah, he, he does fit well for this course. He hasn't had a lot of action this year. Um, it's a little bit pricey for me. I guess I like the options just as much down in that 8K range as him, but, but I'm not against him. So let's talk about some of these names, and we'll do them quickly. Fitzpatrick, Kuchar, and Oosthuis, and and even Kevin Na. All these guys, I mean, uh, Kuchar and Na have played well in this course before. Oosthuis is one of the great ball strikers. And Fitzpatrick, you and I have been talking about this guy for two or three years. Can any of these four guys win this tournament? I'm not sure any of them is going to win it, but I think they can definitely put up a top 20 for you. All four of them could. A lot of people are down on Kuchar. He did not look good at all last week at Mexico. But consistently, he plays well at this course. I've heard people say he's just done. And I I think I'm going to have to see a little bit more before I I say that because he does go into lulls, but then he snaps out of it. And uh, I think it's a decent week to own him. I have him in cash, cash games and GPPs. Uh, One guy who I really like is uh, Ches Revy at 7,900. I run our model many different ways with many different inputs, stats, uh, current form, and he pops on just about every way I run it. And he's 7,900. He was killing it earlier in the year. He's had a couple of so-so efforts, but I kind of like him this week uh, in that 7K range. Jeff, the question I have about Chez is, I, when I think Chez, I think California. He's never been a Florida player. Why is, he, why is that going to transfer? I don't think he's been he, – he hasn't been nearly the player he is now. I mean, this is the best he's ever played in his career. He's never been very good. Um, I, I think he played he's, – he's played relatively well. He's got a couple top 30s in his last two outings here. He's just a different player and one of these guys who's tough to compare what they've ever done with, with what he's doing now. All right, I'm going to give you three guys in this high sevens, Duffner, Reed, and Zach Johnson. What if I told you one or two of these guys are going to be in the top ten this week? It would not surprise me. Duffner has been phenomenal here. In every appearance, he's never finished outside the top 30, which is absolutely incredible. He kills it here. And I think his price should have been closer to 8,800 rather than 7,800. So I think for that reason, he's going to be chalky. I think you've got to lock him into your cash game just because of the outstanding value. But I also like his upside here. So I like him probably the best of those three guys. Patrick Reed, I'm a Patrick Reed guy, but he's been playing so poorly. I expect him to break out one of these weeks. I wish I could tell you which one. Uh, this is a good fit for him on this course, but he his game all around has not been good. All right, let's move down a little bit. Steve Stricker really hasn't played a lot yet this season, but he is a very good ball striker for an old dude, and uh, I'm very jealous of him. Can this guy be a top 20? I never think he can. <laughs> it's like, how do you how do you once in a while play on tour and be able to compete with these guys? I, I, he defies the odds, but he's a good cut maker. Uh, his upside, I think, is kind of limited, to be honest with you. So cash games, yes, GPPs, I'm not big on him. But, yeah, if you want a top 30 out of a guy at 7,500, I think he, he'll probably make the cut. All right, Streelman and Schwartzel have done very well in the past in this tournament. Can they do it again this year? I like Strillman a lot this week. I have him in my core. I will own him in cash and GPP. I think he's got a lot of upside. And plus, I think his floor is really high as well. 
Charo, a little bit riskier play because he hasn't been playing well, but he plays well at Copperhead, so I'm okay with him probably more for GPPs. And then also Snedeker down here. This is a really cheap price for a guy who just missed at Honda, uh, had been playing pretty decent up until that point. So I think he's a good guy to mix in there as well. All right, DeChambeau, we, we see him on TV a lot. The guy's a very thoughtful player using all these advanced analytics. Can he, he played well here years ago when he was younger. Can he surprise? Possibly. He, he is a, he's a wild card, Doc. I never know what to do with him. I, I really don't. He, he's, he can be so good and be so bad. He, he played well here last year, I remember. But, um, you know, I just don't know. Probably just for GPPs, you could take a flyer on him. I wouldn't own him probably more than 10% on your teams. If you're doing one team, I wouldn't own him. If you're doing, you know, like the 20 max or something, maybe own him on two or three teams if you want to take a shot with him. All right. When I get to that $7,000 range, there are guys, you know, Aaron Wise, Billy Horschel, Varner. It gets pretty ugly. Is there anybody in that 68 to 7,200 range that are worth it? Yeah, I think there's a few guys who are uh, definitely guys I like more than others. John Huss at 7,300. I know you said 72, but I wanted to mix him in at 73. Um, I kind of like Brandon Harkins. He's down in this area, and he's been playing really well this season, and no one's going to own him. I think we're just looking for guys who have a a, a chance to pop for us, but uh, the odds are are slim. Um, Who else do I like down in this range? Um, You know, Austin Cook is 7,100, and he's a guy who I really like. He pulled out of Honda with what they said was a possible wrist ache or wrist injury. I don't know how serious it is, but if he's, if he's able to play and play and not without pain, I like him a ton at 7,100 this week, but there's that little, you know, not sure if he's a hundred percent, but definitely worth a flyer in GPPs because he has a ton of upside. All right, Jeff, before we let you go, give me a guy not named Jordan Spieth who can win this tournament. I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with Justin Rose. I think he he can definitely win it this week. If you want someone, you want someone lower than that, even Doc. Sure, sure. All right, I'll give you um, I'll go with Ches Reevy. Look at that, and give me one guy that people are gonna play who is not worth it the money. Um, you know, I would probably say. Um, I think Rory might have, have, have some ownership despite the, the fact that he's not playing very well. I don't necessarily love him for this course. I think he's still going to be owned by like 10 to 12% of the field. So I would say him. All right. Sounds good. I'm not playing him, and I'm trusting Chez. And if he wins, I'm going to thank you, my friend. Oh, if he wins, um, yeah, we're going to have a big party because I can outright on him. So <laughs> There you go. All right, Jeff Ferguson, good luck, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Doc. Thanks. All right, take care. That's Jeff Ferguson, Fantasy Golf Insider. Dot- 